Yeah, Sean and I were just debating what, what to uh, open with this morning, and then neither of us could remember who was doing it. So there you go. Blame the coronavirus, everything else is to blame for the coronavirus. Good morning, welcome to worship. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Great to have you with us here today. Whether you are here in person or whether you are worshipping with us from home, we're certainly glad that you're able to be with us this morning. One sad announcement with which to begin today, many of you will already know this, but we learned on Tuesday of the sudden death of Elizabeth Poole, uh, Tom and Leslie's daughter. Um, Elizabeth grew up in the church, and if you've been here for any time, you'd probably remember her. She'd been diagnosed with some kind of seizures earlier in the year, and so we're assuming that's what happened. Doesn't make much difference, I suppose, in the end, does it? Um, it's another grieving family within the life of the church, so we covet your prayers. Um, Elizabeth had been back with her daughter Ava many times over the years, so you probably had seen her, especially if you came to the early service. There will be a memorial service here, uh, September the 19th, provisionally at 10 o'clock in the morning, if you're able to be with us then to support Tom and Leslie Poole, I'm sure they'd appreciate it. In the meantime, let's, uh, let's cover that family with our prayers. Well, now let us worship God together. I invite you to stand with me, if you're able, for our call to worship, which this morning comes from 2 Chronicles 20. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand. No one can withstand you. Amen. Father of creation, unfold your sovereign plan. Raise up a chosen generation that will march through the land. All of creation.
be seated. How great he is. Amen? He bled and died to take away my sin. Listen to 1 Peter. Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. So now let's take some time. Acknowledge our disobedience, our sin, with silent confession to him. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. Gracious God, we confess the pride that dares not admit that it was wrong, the self that can see nothing but its own will, the self-righteousness that knows no fault except in others, the anxiety and fear that keep us from doing your will, the callousness that has ceased to care, the defiance that does not regret its own misdeeds, and the evasion that constantly makes excuses. Forgive us, Lord, we pray, and lead us to the place of obedience. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Scripture says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation, that the old has passed away. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of what Jesus did we are righteous before God amen amen let's stand to sing our response give to the winds your fears glad you said that. We are in the middle of a coin shortage. However, pennies for hunger will take folding money. They'll even take checks. We've not figured out a way to do credit cards yet, but that may be coming. What I really do want to talk to you about this morning, though, we've had several months of no Sunday school. And as you know, these cans usually sit in Sunday school rooms, and we drop our change in them all the time. So I found this one in my Sunday school room this morning, and it does have some change in it, and it's got a couple of dollar bills in there. So what I really want to remind us of is even though there's a coin shortage, uh, even though there's a pandemic going on, there are children in Haiti who need our support. Pennies from Hunger started with just taking care of mothers and babies and making sure they had milk and food. And then they started doing nutritional programs so that those women could take care of their children. And now, because of two hurricanes 
and COVID, that, that island is in such desperate shape. So they still need Pennies for Hunger for the normal programs, but now they're also using Pennies for Hunger money for uh, medical care because there's pitiful medical care in Haiti. And so some of the money is going toward doctors, hospitals, just keeping people alive. So we desperately need your money. We're going to put one of these cans in the Northex, and we'll be collecting all month. But remember, at the end of the month, you can put folding money. You can put a check. Like I say, I don't know how to do credit cards yet. We may figure that out. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your money, and we really do appreciate it. The first fruits. Hey, that was big folding money. Amen, amen. God is so good. He has given us so much. And now our turn. We can give back to him. Let us bring our tithes and offerings to him. God, we listen for your voice, placing our trust in your truth and grace. We bring these gifts in gratitude for the truth that has set us free and for the grace that saves us. Take and use them so that others may add, be added to your kingdom. We pray in the name of the one who sustains us throughout life's journey, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture today is Genesis 50, verses 15 through 26. Uh, the scripture is printed in your order of service if you'd like to follow along. Let us hear the word of God. When Joseph's brothers saw that his, their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph, hold, Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers that sinned and, wronged, and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. 
Now please forgive the sins of your servants of the father, the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers came and threw themselves down before him. We are slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. I am in the place of God. You intended harm to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done and saving many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph stayed in Egypt along with all his father's family. He lived 110 years and saw the third generation of Ephraim's children, also the children of Mekir, son of Manasseh, who was placed at birth on Joseph's knee. When Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and keep you, take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you, Amy. And then, just by way of commentary, I suppose, from uh, Paul's speech to the Athenians on Mars Hill. Some of us were on Mars Hill last year. And these words from Acts 17, verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. God, the source of all life, the source of all breath, the creator and the sustainer of all things, who does not need the service of human hands, this God, the unknown God of the Greeks, has been made known to us in Jesus Christ. Well, we've reached the uh, last chapter of Genesis, and with it, the death of Joseph, Joseph whose story we've been following for I don't know how many weeks now, but quite a while. It was uh, just the previous chapter, if you've been reading, I know some people have been reading through the rest of the text as well, uh, previous chapter uh, was the death of Jacob, his father, and now in this final chapter, as I say, we get to the death of Joseph. And so the story ends, I suppose, as uh, Every human story must. But not with the shrieking, agonizing, hanging on for one last breath of so much modern literature. This is very different, isn't it? No. Both Jacob and Joseph enjoy what the Victorians would have called a good death a good death. Jacob, for example, previous chapter, aware that death is near, witnesses to his trust in God. He commends all of his sons to their maker, commends them by name, and then he bows his head in worship. There's actually a reference to Jacob in Hebrews chapter 11. It's not really clear exactly which part of the story it's referring to, but nevertheless, Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith, as some people call it in the New Testament. Listen to verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. So I want you to imagine that just for a moment, if you would. The family gathers around in the bedroom where Jacob is lying. He asks for help, and two of his sons help him to stand upright, he leans on his old staff, and with his free hand raised above them, 
he gives them one last blessing. And you know what? That is the highlight of Jacob's life. At least one of them. I think it's the highest point. He's secure in his salvation. Oh, he knows that he hasn't always been faithful. If you know the story of Jacob, you'll know that well enough. His life has been a mixture of good and evil. He's played fast and loose with the law. He's wallowed in self-pity these many years. But now, as he faces his last days, he is at peace with God. And so, with deep gratitude for all that has passed and entrusting his future to the eternal covenant, the old patriarch finally dies. As Scripture says, he is gathered into his father's and to his father's God, which in my book makes it a good death. I wonder, are you, are you ready for a good death? Am I? It's a question we all have to ask, I think. Is that, uh, is that too morbid a question for a holiday weekend? I hope not. It's an important one. To what will you bear witness when you breathe your last? To fear or to faith? Well, let's pray together and then we'll look at this text and ask that God might guide us into all truth. Let's pray. Father, without the light of Your Holy Spirit falling upon these pages, they would just be ancient history to us. But if You would come amongst us now in Holy Spirit power, then these words may still speak to us today. And that's what we ask. Oh Lord, would You prepare us to live and to die boldly without fear. So come Holy Spirit, come. Open this book and open our hearts. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. There is, as always, an outline for you in sermon seats inside your bulletin for today, should you wish to follow along with me. You know, there are some very strong emotions swirling around in this last chapter of Genesis. As I run through them, um, ask yourself, how do they relate to yours? And not just this morning, obviously, but how do they relate to the way in which you think about your own mortality? We begin with Jacob's sons and what I've called their irrational fears, their irrational fears. Now, you can kind of understand what happened here. After Jacob's death, the boys they weren't boys by now. They were all grown men. But nevertheless, the boys began to worry about their powerful brother, Joseph. Joseph, whom they had wronged. Well, most of them had wronged anyway many years before. If you have your Bible with you, look at verse 15 of Genesis 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, oh, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us? and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him. And so they sent word to Joseph saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God of your father. The odd thing was, of course, as I'm sure you know, the whole thing was made up. It was a lie. Jacob had left no such instructions at all. They were just trying to cover themselves. Now, okay, the underlying confession was genuine, but they kind of wrapped it up so that uh, hopefully Joseph would bring himself to forgive them. They had indeed treated Joseph dreadfully. There's no other word for it. They were still, I think, by the look of it, some of them consumed by guilt. They were not at all sure that he actually had forgiven them. And yet, when you think about it, their fear was completely irrational. Why? Well, you know the story. It was irrational because there is not the slightest evidence whatsoever that Joseph intended to punish them. 
there is no hint of malice whatsoever behind his actions. Don't they remember how 17 years before, Joseph had forgiven them and wept with them? Had they forgotten that they and their brother had been reconciled? So Joseph's brothers acted out of fear. They believed that while he lived, Jacob, their father, had in a sense protected them. And you can understand that. But now that he was gone, oh my goodness, those fears surfaced, kept them awake at night. Would Joseph take his revenge? But they needn't have worried. When he heard what they had to say, according to this text, even though I suspect he knew it was not exactly based upon the truth, Joseph did not summon his bodyguard as he could have done and have them arrested or worse. Instead, he did what he had done 17 years earlier, and he wept. If he had had doubts about their sincerity, well, he didn't have any now, surely, after all these years. Fear, irrational or otherwise, can play a big role, can't it, at a time of loss? I remember a man many years ago now, not here, uh, but in a different church, a committed Christian who, as he lay dying, confessed his guilt. Now, this is not terribly unusual, but his was a special. He'd been a commando during the Second World War and had operated a lot of the time behind enemy lines. He would parachuted into France before D-Day, and uh, he'd used his special skills, as he used to call them, for to do things for which, had it not been a war, he would have been hung. He told me once that he'd lost count of the number of people that he'd murdered. And there, lying on his deathbed, as surely it was, facing eternity, it all came rushing back to him. The guilt. Some of the people he'd murdered had been very young. The fear, would he still face the consequences? But more than anything else, the self-loathing as a Christian for what he had had to do. It was all too much for him. It was simply overwhelming. The only solution that we could come to was to impress upon him those promises that he had laid hold of when he had first come to know the Lord as a young man. Maybe promises like these. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Do not fear, says the Lord, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Or Isaiah 26, verse 3, You will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Or how do you choose in the New Testament? There are so many of them. But what about Matthew eleven twenty eight? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That was what he wanted. That's what he needed more than anything else, was rest. He was tortured on the inside. And the only thing that could give him peace was the presence and the power of God in Christ. Would he trust his emotions? Would he trust his feelings? Would he succumb to his fears? Or would he instead eventually come to trust once again in the Word of God, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, which had brought him to repentance and faith in Christ? Praise God, just to fill the story in for you, that as he breathed his last, he was able to leave behind the terrors that had consumed him. He was able to leave behind the irrational fears that crippled him and to step by faith into the everlasting arms. So here's your question. Have you dealt with that kind of fear in your life? Now, as a Christian, you are allowed to be apprehensive 
shall I say, about the process of death. Nobody, nobody looks forward to that at all, especially not knowing what it might entail for you. But you have no business as a Christian fearing death itself. For you have God's promises to rest your head upon. And you have been redeemed. Presbyterians are allowed to say, Amen. Amen. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. <laughs> so let's turn to the second thing, shall we? Let's turn from fear in the story to immovable confidence. Immovable confidence. And for this, I want us to look at Joseph himself. Now, two times he told his brothers not to be afraid. Perhaps you saw that. And then he gave them three reasons why not. He must have been a preacher in his spare time. He had three reasons why they should not be afraid, why they could have confidence in God. Let's look at them, shall we? First, he told them that he did not intend to play God. You get that? Some things are God's business, and some things are our business. When we play God, we get them just ever so slightly confused. Here's verse 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? The obvious answer is no. It's a rhetorical question. No, of course he's not in the place of God. He could have played God, couldn't he? He had the power to do so. He'd earned Pharaoh's trust. He had enormous power at his disposal. Had he chosen to use it, he could easily have done so. But he didn't, because he knew that vengeance belongs to the Lord. Perhaps more importantly in a way, though, he recognized, I think, that he himself had made mistakes. He'd sinned. How on earth could he be an impartial judge as God is? Uh, to use a New Testament image, he was in no position to be the thrower of the first stone, was he? So he left the consequences to God. As far as he was concerned, his brothers did not need to be afraid. In passing, I can't help but thinking that our world would be a kinder place if we did not play God quite so often, if we did not love to act as judge and jury quite so readily, if we did not like dispensing our version of justice like a medieval monarch, ringing any bells, the only time when you and I should play God is when we take the towel and the bowl and wash our neighbor's feet. So that's the first reason. Don't pretend to be God. But then Joseph continued, his brothers should not fear. Secondly, because of the providence of God. His story pointed to the providence of God. Uh, next verse, verse 20. Very famous verse. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You intended it for this. God had other plans. He intended it for good. Now, we've seen this before, obviously, and I've mentioned this verse before. Everything in the story, from uh, Jacob's misplaced favoritism to, his, uh, to Joseph's brother's malice and envy in those early verses, everything from the evil intentions of Potiphar's wife to the dreams that Joseph was given wisdom to interpret. Everything was overseen by God's gracious yet sovereign hand. Paul would put it differently later in the Presbyterian verse of the New Testament, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Now, this is the golden thread, if you like, that uh, runs throughout Joseph's story in its entirety. 
God is not the author of evil, but He can use evil for His own purposes. He is actively working out His purpose and His plan, which means that our lives are not governed by, by chance or even by choice. Ultimately, our destiny is decided by a benevolent God. Now, I came across an illustration of this some years ago that helped me, and I wonder if it, it might help you. A friend of mine once showed me a Victorian bookmark. He actually gave it to me, and I'm sure I have it inside a book somewhere, but I couldn't find it this week, so you'll have to live without it. He showed me this bookmark. It was uh, one of those really fancy ones that must have been quite expensive when they were first made, because it was silk. Beautiful thing. I have got 30 bazillion bookmarks in my office, but you know, perhaps in those days, folks would only have three or four. Anyway, it was beautifully embroidered. But when first he showed it to me, you couldn't tell that because, well, all you could see was a, a kind of tangle of, of colored threads overlapping, interlacing, and actually making no sense whatsoever. I mean, okay, as a bookmark, fair enough, but... And then he turned it over because, of course, he'd been showing me the back. And on the other side, embroidered, if that's the right word, in uh, copper plate hand with the words, God is love. So on the back, don't make any sense. You know, you can look through it. You can, uh, uh, you can see where all the threads, the same threads that are on the other side, but you can't understand what it is. From your perspective, you can see nothing at all. But then from the other side, it suddenly comes into focus, and you understand what God was doing. From my side, a mass of confusion. From God's side, listen, perfect sense, perfect harmony, perfect love. But you know, even when you can't see that, when everything in your life is as debilitating and difficult as 2020, there you go, that's a good illustration for the next 50 years. When everything feels like this year, even when you cannot see your way through, you can still trust the God who holds eternity in the hollow of His hand. Our confidence comes from when we refuse to play God first and from our trust in God's providence, secondly. Just one more thing. It's a very brief little thing. You may not even have noticed it. The brothers had confidence in Joseph because he promised to take care of them. So the very next verse, verse 21, don't be afraid. says it again. Don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. They'd experienced his generosity for 17 years. His kindness had not suddenly evaporated. He was still the same. As he had been, so would he continue to be. Just like God. Our confidence in God is immovable because he keeps his promises. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on Him, for He cares for you. As God was, so He is now, so shall He ever be. In a story that's dominated by images of our mortality, we're reminded not to give in to irrational fears. That's the first thing but instead, secondly, to have immovable confidence in God. The last thing I think we learn from the whole story is that death is only an interim resting place. Look at verse 24. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land He promised on oath to Abraham Isaac and Jacob. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath and said, 
God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. Joseph had lived most of his adult life in Egypt. He had received, as you know, multiple honors there. He'd risen to the highest rank in the household of Pharaoh. He'd taken an Egyptian wife. His sons had been born there, and yet it was not his home. Neither was it Israel's home, the people of Israel, that is. Here's the promise. People of God have held on to this promise for, for centuries. In the fullness of time, the children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would go back to Canaan, and it would be for them the promised land. Now, it would take 430 years, but that's a twinkle of an eye in the sight of God. The Word would be fulfilled. God would indeed come to their aid. And when He did, when all of those who heard Him were themselves reduced to dust, well, Joseph had one last request. Did you see it? Verse 25, carry my bones up from this place. He wants to be buried back in his father's land. This place is only temporary, he seems to say. It's just an interim arrangement. Carry me back, says Joseph. Carry me back to my Father's land. My friends, this is not our home. We're just strangers here. We're just aliens in a foreign land. Our, our bones may rest for a time in distant soil, but our destiny is heaven. We look forward to a day when the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, when those whom God has called shall walk on streets of gold, when there will be no more crying, no more bitterness, no more pain, for the former things will have passed away. Hold on to that hope of a new heaven and a new earth. Hold on to Christ, the Lamb of God, who once was dead, but now who lives and reigns forevermore. Sean, have we time for a story before you pray? Well, I've got the microphone, so you're going to get a story anyway. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, some of you have heard this story before, but if you haven't, you need to. There was once a Scotsman who left his homeland as a young man and traveled to Canada. He worked hard, and he made his fortune. He married settled down, raised a family. Life was good, but he always missed the glens of Scotland. Finally, he decided that if he was to see his homeland again, he must go before he got too old to travel. So he booked his berth on an ocean liner bound for Glasgow. You can tell this is an old story, but that doesn't matter. And when the day came, he went on board, impatiently anticipating the day when he would step ashore in Scotland for the first time since he had left it over 60 years before. And the voyage was without incident, except that it was long. And every day he would ask the captain like a child, are we not there yet? Just a little longer the captain would reply. And then as so often happens, as they neared their destination, thick mist descended. <laughs> he couldn't see anything at all over the side of the boat. And in his frustration, the man asked the captain yet again, are we not there yet? Surely we must be. And the captain replied, just a little longer, just a little longer, go to bed, close your eyes and sleep. I promise you that when you open them in the morning, the mist will have lifted and you will see your Father's land. And so it was. 
Christian, set aside your fears, for God has spoken. Christian, put your full confidence in your Savior. Christian, remember that you will be here for but a little while. You may close your eyes in darkness, but when you open them in the morning, the mist will have lifted and the sunshine of God's glory will break through the clouds of despair and doubt. And on that day, here's the promise, you will see your Father's land. Amen. And now to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Someday, Father, someday real soon, we will see you face to face. Our King, our God, infinitely powerful. Intensely personal. We are here today and gone tomorrow. Father, would you help us? Help us to heed your word this morning, to obey and put it into practice. Help us to live like we believe it. You have redeemed us. You have made us your children. We are a part of your family, and this is not our home. Oh, thank you for your amazing grace and mercy and compassion that you compound upon us day after day after day. Forgive us for taking it for granted, for being more concerned with earthly stuff than you, than your will, than your purpose for us. Let that change in our hearts and minds now, O oh God. God of love, God of healing, God of wisdom, we pray for those who are hurting and suffering. Continue to lift up Jet, Rex, Joyce, Carrie, Ed, and Erica. We pray for Deb and Matt for comfort, peace, and healing. We lift up Tom and Leslie to you in the loss of Tom's daughter. For your perfect peace to flood their hearts and minds right now. Please, O oh God. We lift up our members in military service. You bring them home safely to their families you protect them, that you would let their light shine. We pray for Alan and Leslie, for your continued blessing and rest and wisdom and guidance upon them, upon their boys, upon their granddaughter. We lift up the session, the youth team, for your wisdom and guidance and discernment through these times, to know your will for Covenant Presbyterian, to know your plan, to discern and to act boldly and courageously, O oh God. We lift up Stephen and Carrie, all those who are spreading your gospel here in Lake Jackson to across the world for protection, for wisdom, 
courage as they face unimaginable horrors just for speaking your truth. Oh God, let your words fall on good ground. Prepare the hearts and minds of those who hear the greatest news ever and let them be saved. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name and it's in his words that we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Stand to sing what a beautiful name.
So now go in peace to love and serve for the Lord. Be not afraid. Put your confidence in Him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. And God's people, wherever they are, said, Amen. Amen.